glory. Thankful to be here. Thankful for another opportunity. Sorry for my screaming children. The yeah, <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm thankful to be here tonight. Thankful for my wife and my children that are here. I'm thankful that they're. I know that they're. They're not big. They're not old enough yet to go where they want to go and do what they want to do yet. But I'm thankful that uh, I have a spouse that we're in the same same mindset of we're going to raise our kids in church we're going to raise our kids in the house of God uh, if you would turn with me in your Bibles here tonight to Luke chapter number 14 and Keaton and Landon I'm sorry I'm going to switch the scriptures up just a little bit we're going to start in verse 16 and we're going to stop at verse number 23 when you have it if you wouldn't mind please stand for the reading of the word <clears throat> thankful for everybody that's here tonight and Thankful for everybody watching by way of live stream tonight. <coughs> Starting with verse number 16. Then said he unto him, a certain man made a great supper that, and bade many, and sent his servant at supper time to say to them that were bidden, come for all, th all things are now ready. And they all with one con con consent, sorry, and they all with one consent began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I have bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray thee have me excused. And ha another said, I have bought five yoke of oxen, and I go to prove them. I pray thee have me excused. And another said, I have married a wife, and therefore I cannot come. So that servant came and showed his Lord these things. Then the master of the house being angry said to his servant, Go out quickly into the streets and lanes of the city and bring in hither the poor and the maimed and the halt and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done as thou hast commanded, and yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out into the highways and the hedges and compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. With the help of the Lord here tonight, I want to preach this message that the word that the Lord gave me. Uh, take them with you. Father, we thank you for the wonderful spirit and privilege and honor it is to be in your house tonight. We thank you that you're here with us, God. We thank you for every heart and life that's, with, that's represented here tonight, God. And I just ask that you would anoint me and speak through me here tonight, God, that you would touch every heart and life that's here with us, and that you would move in the re remainder of this service here tonight, Father. And I ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Tonight, uh, Pastor Ronnie was touching this morning and here just a moment ago on uh, the responsibility as a, of us as believers to sound the alarm and to lay between the porch and the altar and to seek the face of God and to pray and to intercede. But tonight, I want to talk about another responsibility that we all have as believers, and that is being soul winners in this in this lost and dying world and in these last days uh, all of us in here tonight and under the sound of my voice that are believers we all know that at some point it, at some point whether it be by way of the grave or whether it be if the lord tarries or by the way of the rapture our time here on earth it all ha all has a stopping point each one of us in here tonight our life and our time on this earth has an ending it has a beginning and an ending and this world that we find ourselves in it is not our eternal home I'm not telling you anything different than what you know here tonight but just trying to lay a foundation that <clears throat> the world that we find ourselves in it's not our eternal home but it is just a temporal place with a temporal body getting us to our final destination in eternity. Our days here are numbered, and I don't say that to, to scare you here tonight, and I don't say that to, to try and draw any kind of emotion out of you tonight, but I just want to, us to know and have the reality that our days on this earth are numbered. From the very beginning of time, long before we were ever born, God had us planned, and He had us planned out and knows exactly the number of days that we are going to be here on this earth and Job 14 and verse number five says seeing his days are determined the number of his months are with you you have appointed his bounds that he cannot pass we will not live one more day past the time that God has set us here on this earth for it is if it is our time to go then it is our time to leave this world and to meet him whether we've made ourselves ready to meet him or not 
Everything, including our lives, has an appointed time of beginning and an appointed time of ending. I know, and I'm just going to use this analogy and this example here tonight. I know talking with Kyla, uh, working at the middle school, uh, it, school is almost over with, and about every day she comes home and she tells me or my parents or her parents or whoever may be listening that school is almost, and th- this, these are her words, School is almost over and the kids just don't care because they're ready to be out of school. So they just do whatever they want and they don't care. They don't care what the teachers say. They don't care what the people think about them. They don't care what they say or who they say it to. All they know is is that school is almost over with. Give me just a moment. I'm going somewhere with this. I promise you. All they know is that the appointed time they have to go to school five days a week is almost up. So their caring and their self-awareness has diminished because they know it's almost over with for the year. And summer break, what they've been longing for since that first day of school is just a few days away. Now, (coughs) you say, Austin, where are you going with this? This is where I'm going with this. As believers, if we truly believe that this is not our final home and that we believe that time is wrapping up and that the rapture could take place at any moment, then what we do in these final days before we leave this world is up to us. What we do with the time that we have remaining on this earth and how we spend them is our responsibility and is up to us. Hallelujah. Listen, I'm I'm 30 years old. I'll be 31 in July. And I I did the math yesterday. I've lived 11,265 days thus far in my life. 11,265 days out of however many days days God has for me to be here on this earth. And however many days that I have left if I truly believe what I say and what I preach then how I live and how I spend those days and what I do with them it is the same for us here tonight is up to us as the church hallelujah We can spend these last days focusing on temporal things and building up treasures here on this earth or we can spend them doing everything that we possibly can to get everyone we can to the very same table of the Father's feast that somebody else brought us to that we are sitting at here tonight. Hallelujah. We're in an hour that we we are in an hour where we cannot just skate by and coast through and until eternity. God never meant to save us just for us to coast through life and not ever tell anybody about him and what he's done for us. But he saved us and he set us on a road to eternity with him for us to reach out and to grab everybody we can and tell everybody that we can and take them with us. Hallelujah. He saved us for us to be like this servant in our text here tonight, running into the streets, running into the lanes and the highways and the hedges hallelujah and the gathering the lame the poor the halt and the blind and compelling them to come to the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus Christ hallelujah 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 glory to God just like (coughs) this may be the only time you ever hear me say this but just like the middle schoolers You got it. You may never hear it again. But just like the middle schoolers, we have got to come to a place where if we truly believe that eternity, the eternity that with him that we have been longing for and hoping for and trusting for is closer than we have ever imagined, whether it's eternity and glory with God or eternity separated from him in hell. Because friend, I hate to tell you this here tonight, but that is the only two options there is, whether you believe me or not. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. But if we as believers truly believe that, then it is our responsibility that we do everything in our power to win the lost and get them into the house of God and into relationship with him. Hallelujah. Throwing our own reputation, throwing our own ego and our own cares to the side and say, I love you too much to care. I love you too much to care what somebody may think about me I cared you 
and love you too much to, to worry about whether somebody says that person is a crazy Bible thumper. I love them too much to hold the gospel and the truth and keep it to myself knowing that they're lost and knowing that they're on a road to a devil's hell separated from God for eternity. Is that you here tonight? Hallelujah. 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 Regardless, hallelujah. <coughs> regardless of what others may think or feel about us, regardless of what others may say about us, regardless of how uncomfortable and out of our comfort zone it may be, if we truly believe what we believe and say we believe, <coughs> And if we truly believe that eternity is just around the corner, and I already said it a moment ago, if we truly love people like we say we love people, then our focus must be taking them to a place called heaven. Hallelujah be unto God. Listen, we, when we find ourselves in a situation where the Holy Spirit is prompting us to, to talk and to share the gospel with them, with, with somebody, our own desires and our own concerns are out the window. Listen. Listen, friend, when the Holy Spirit begins to, begins to move on you and say, this person is hurting, this person is lost, this person is on their way to a devil's hell, hallelujah all bets are off friend because just like i i've, I've made the statement from this pulpit about preaching and where 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 when you, when somebody is taking the pulpit and standing behind this sacred desk people's eternal destination is in the balance well guess what friend each person you come in contact with their eternal destination is also in the balance you're not on a pulpit, but you're at work or you're at school or you're in your families or you're walking down the street or you're in the grocery store. Listen, we are in a world where we're in a place now where Christianity is pert near the minority anymore. So that means when you're walking through the grocery store, majority of the time and a lot of the people you're going to run into are not going to be saved and in covenant with Christ. What are you doing in that time? What are you doing in that day? You could be standing there getting, for us it would be getting cereal and slices of cheese and gallons of milk, frozen pizzas and whatnot. What happens if we're prompted while we're grabbing something off of the shelf and the Lord says, this person here next to you is hurting and they're lost. They need to hear the gospel. What are we going to do with that? What are we going to do, friend? You say, oh, that's out of my comfort zone. I don't really like that. I don't really, that's not really my thing, friend. We don't know what kind of mental state or spiritual state that person might be in. And I'm just going to be real with you here. You may be at the grocery store and you may be just striking up small talk conversation with somebody while you're getting your groceries. But inside that person may be making plans to go home to end their life getting what they need at the store to just say well this is this is the last of the last of what I'm going to experience here on earth and I'm just going to go home and end it because I see no hope in sight and friend you carry that hope inside of you and you're standing right next to them and the Holy Spirit is prompting you and saying give them the hope that they need give them the hope that you carry don't keep it to yourself <coughs> I'll never forget Brother Todd Sloggett. I heard he told this story. He, uh, he in his days of evangelizing and, and preaching across this nation, I believe he said he was in Oklahoma and he was staying. He had just gotten service was over. He was preaching at a revival. Service was over with. He went to his hotel and he gets inside. Well, across from his hotel, he could see through the window was a big outdoor biker bar. He was, he was way out. He was out west somewhere, Oklahoma or California maybe. But across the street from his hotel was this out open air biker bar. And he could see that there was a chapter of the Bandidos biker gang that was there. And he said, in, he said from across the street. Now, Brother Todd Sloggett is six foot eight. 
He is a tall, he is a giant. He said, from across the street, I could see this biker standing above everybody else with a Bandito's biker gang vest on. He said, he was one of the biggest men I have ever seen in my life. That's a big man coming from somebody who's already six foot eight. But he said, I looked as I was going into my hotel room and I noticed this man. And he said, all I heard the Lord say was, go tell that man that I love him. Brother Todd Sloggett said, I turned the key in my door and I walked in and said, That's, that wasn't the Lord. That wasn't the Lord. He said, I'm just going to go in. I'm tired. I'm going to go in. I'm going to get changed and cleaned up from service and I'm going to lay down. I'm going to go to bed. He said, for the next several, for the next several moments, tell that man that I love him. He said, it went from, he said it, My apologies. My phone's connected to my iPad, and my iPad started ringing. But Brother Todd Sloggett said it went from just a simple, go tell that man that I love him, to a concerned and a stern, go tell that man that I love him. He said, then the last time the Lord said it, he said it was like he screamed at me, go tell that man that I love him. Brother Todd Sloggett said, I got up, I walked out, he said, I walked over, and he said, this man got bigger and bigger the closer that I got to him. He said, I reached up and tapped him on the shoulder. He said, this giant turned around and said, what do you want? He said, I leaned back and said, sir, this may sound strange, but God said to tell you that he loves you. He said that all of the air left that man. He said he was swelled up and he said he dropped his shoulders and he kept going and collapsed on the floor in front of Brother Todd Sloggett. Brother Sloggett said, I knelt down. He said, and he, he, he said that man looked and he ran off all of his biker buddies. And Brother Todd Sloggett said, I said, friend, the Lord told me just to tell you that he loves you. And he said, that man grabbed a hold of me and said, sir, I know you have no idea who I am. And I have no idea who you are. But I want to tell you, he said, last night, I, my, he said, last night at my house, he said, I had a gun to my head and said, God, if you don't show me that you're real and that you really love me and that you're really for me, then I'm going to kill myself tomorrow night, brother. Brother Todd Sloggett was the man who was standing in the gap and was obedient to the word of the Lord. And that man in the middle of a biker bar got saved, set free, and delivered. Hallelujah. He didn't end it, but it was because somebody said, I've got to take everybody I can to heaven with me. Hallelujah. 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 Friend, <coughs> hear me tonight. When God is prompting us to say something to somebody, we don't know where they're at. Had Brother Sloggett not been obedient to the voice of the Lord, that man would have ended his life that night and would have been lost in a devil's hell for eternity. All because one person was not obedient. All because one person wouldn't have been obedient. But Brother Todd Sloggett said, Lord, I hear you. And listen, it was out of his comfort zone. He'll be the first to tell you. He said, he said I did not want to do it. I didn't want, he said, I tried not to do it. But when he was obedient, hallelujah. When he was obedient, the Lord honored it. And the Lord won another soul to the kingdom. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If we believe this gospel that we say that we believe and we believe it to be truth, what are we going to say when we stand before God on our judgment day and he asks us why we kept it to ourselves and didn't work and do everything we could to share it with everyone that we could? Hallelujah. <coughs> Hallelujah. Because friend, I'm here to tell you, if we believe this to be truth, 
If we believe this to be truth like we say that we do and it's the only help for a lost and a dying world and the only thing that can pull somebody out of the pit of sin that they're in and we keep it to ourselves. Every sinner we come in contact with is going to continue to find no help in this world but finding that but finding themselves spiraling deeper and deeper into a pit of sin and bondage hallelujah you may not be called to a pulpit ministry and that's fine I touched on this a moment ago, but I want to hit it again. You may not be called to a pulpit ministry, and that's fine, friend. But my pastor for 10 years after I got saved, Pastor Tim Noble, and I've said it here before, he told me as a young man seeking what I was called to do and what God had had, had put me on this earth to do, he said, Austin, everything is ministry. Hallelujah. And everyone is called to ministry. Everything we do is believers should be a witness and a testimony of the gospel of Jesus Christ to everyone that we come into contact with. (coughs) Excuse me. And I'll even take it a step here further tonight and say every one of us as believers in this house is called to be soul winners. I'll say it again. Every one of us in this house as believers is called to be soul winners. Hallelujah. Jesus gave the great commission to his disciples. Pastor Ronnie touched on it this morning. He gave the great, he gave the great commission to his disciples and he said, go ye into all of the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Hallelujah. Well, friend, as believers here tonight, we are his disciples. Hallelujah. And if we are his disciples, we are called to be soul winners, taking the gospel into this lost and dying world that we venture into every single day. And if we're having to go into a dark world, we may as well take the light of the gospel and let it shine bright in the darkness that we find ourselves to everybody that's around us. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a shout of praise here tonight? Hallelujah. 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 In our text here tonight, in our text, there was no stipulations or circumstances that would allow the servant to opt out of gathering people for the marriage supper. There was nothing given by the master that allowed the servant to stop from compelling the people to come to a place at the master's table. But the master said, get everyone that you can. Go and get everybody that you can. Go everywhere that you can and compel the people to come and take a seat at my table. Excuse me, so that my house may be filled. Glory to God. We have no excuse or circumstances that God allows us to not share the gospel with those around us, friend. Hallelujah. But we are instructed by the Father to in all things that we do, do them for his glory and do them so that people would see him in us, feel his love through us and hear the gospel from us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Jack Cunningham, I've quoted him several times before in my messages. He's one of the greatest preachers that is on the earth today. He's one of my favorites to listen to. But Brother Jack Cunningham, he made this statement, and it's one of the most powerful statements that I've ever heard. He said, we don't have the right to determine who gets to hear the gospel and who does not. We do not have the right When the Lord says, witness to this person, tell them that I love them, share my gospel with them. We don't have the right to say, no, not that one. Not that one. I've had a bad day today. Not that one. I'm not really feeling like it today. Not that one. I don't really, that's out of my comfort zone. Not that one. I don't really, that's not really my thing. We don't have that right as believers but our responsibility is to say 
Okay, Lord, you pointed them out to me and you said share the gospel with them. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And friend, who cares if they think that you're crazy? Who cares if they think that you're a nut? Who cares what they may think about you? Because what you did was it may not have, it may, you may not see it right away, but what you did was plant a seed into that soul. You planted a seed into that soul and the Holy Spirit it will honor and water that seed and somewhere down the road <coughs> Somewhere down the road, that seed is going to sprout forth and that soul is going to say, maybe that person isn't as crazy as I thought they were. Hallelujah. We don't have the right. It's not our right and it's not our responsibility to, responsibility to determine who hears and who doesn't hear the gospel. But our responsibility and duty is to always share it and offer it to all of those around us and all that we do everywhere that we find ourselves. Hallelujah. I remember I heard a story from a pastor. It was uh, from an old, it was, uh, I heard a story from a pastor about an old saint of God. <coughs> She had been, her and her husband had been in the ministry for decades and decades. And he had, I believe he had passed on and she was by herself living at home. She was well into her eighties. I think maybe even possibly into her early nineties and she had gotten sick and she had gotten taken to the hospital and and this pastor had young people that this saint that she had poured into over time and and they went to see her and check on her while she was in the hospital and the young people they got there and they came in and they were trying to comfort and they were trying to to minister to her but she ended up ministering to the young people because they got there and they said, sis, you know, we, we, we hate to see you here like this. And we're, we're so sorry that you're sick and in the hospital. And she responded and she said, glory to God. I don't know why you're feeling sorry for me. <laughs> she had been taken to the hospital in, amb in an ambulance by squad. She said, I don't know why you're sorry for me. She said, well, I was in the hospital in between my house and the hospital. She said, I had both EMTs prayed through to salvation and got them saved. And when we got here, we had my nurses prayed through to salvation too. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the hospital, being transported by the EMT squad to what could have been her very last stop here on earth. And she's still doing everything in her power to take one more with her to the place that she knows she's going to. Hallelujah. She understood. Hallelujah. She understood and knew that her days, even though they may be fewer than others, that if she wanted her life and time here on earth to count and to have eternal value, then she had to invest her time in souls. Hallelujah. She knew. <coughs> she knew no matter the circumstances, no matter the situation that I may find myself in while I'm here, I'm going to do my very best to compel them to come to the Father's table. Hallelujah. And friend, I'm here to tell you tonight that our investment must be as believers. It must be in souls. Hallelujah. Because it can't be in things of this world out of our own selfish gain, but it must be invested in souls because they are the only thing that we can take with us to heaven. Hallelujah. That that includes our family members, our friends, our co-workers, our classmates, our teachers, our doctors, our lawyers, the first responders, and our neighbors. That includes those in the jails, the rehab centers, the homeless, the addicts on the street corners, the drunks outside the bars. It includes whosoever will let them come, compel them to the Father's table. Hallelujah. Can you give the Lord a hand clap of praise here tonight? Hallelujah. 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 I'm almost done. Give me just a little bit longer. Hallelujah. And if you're hearing me tonight, if you're under the sound of my voice by way of live stream or maybe even in here tonight. Hallelujah. And you're not in that covenant with God the Father. 
If you're not, if there is, if you are not, if you have not taken your seat at the Father's table, I'm compelling you here tonight. Please come and take your place at the table. Hallelujah. He's not excluded or shunned you tonight, but he's reaching out to you right now. Hallelujah. I just, I just feel led to just go this direction just for a moment. Hallelujah. I just feel led right now to let you know that he's reaching out to you in this moment right now under the sound of my voice to let you know that no matter where you may find yourself at or what you've done he still has a seat for you at his table if you would just come into 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 relationship and covenant with him hallelujah 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 he's never forgotten about you he's never left you hallelujah but he's always been right with you following you everywhere that you've ever went, extending his hand of grace and mercy, waiting for the moment that you would just reach back out towards his hand and take his hand and let him pull you out of the pit that you're in and take your place at his table. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In these last days, our focus as believers on our next destination being glory cannot cloud our focus on the purpose of why we're still here. Now, by clouding our focus, what I mean by that is I don't mean that we don't need to be thinking about heaven very much. I don't mean that at all. What I mean by that is, I mean clouding in the sense of having the attitude and the mentality of I'm on my way to heaven. I'm going to be there soon. So I'm just going to sit back and I'm going to coast through until I get there. We cannot have that attitude as believers. Hallelujah. But, <clears throat> we are, but our focus and our purpose be on the purpose of the, why we are still here. And that is winning the lost and dying world that we're living in. It cannot cloud our focus on that purpose, but it must drive that purpose deeper into our spirits. Hallelujah. It must be knowing that we're on our way to heaven and purposing ourselves to take as many souls to heaven with us as we can. Hallelujah. The saying goes that we can't be so heavenly minded that we are of no earthly good. And I believe that statement should be that if we are heavenly minded, we will be of the utmost earthly good. Hallelujah. Because if we know where we're headed, if we know where we're headed to being eternity with God the Father, and his son Jesus Christ knowing the other option of eternity in hell separated from God and that reality being driven home to us then we would do our very best to get people to come to the knowledge of the truth of the gospel that we carry hallelujah hallelujah I'm almost done I, I, give, me, give me just a little bit longer I want to read this quote by C.S. Lewis here tonight C.S. Lewis wrote, he said, if we read church history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were precisely those who thought most on the next. The apostles who set, on, who set foot on the conversion of the Roman Empire, the great men who built up the Middle Ages, the English evangelicals who abolished the slave trade, all left their mark here on earth because their minds were occupied with heaven. It has become so ineffective in the, it is, it is since Christians have largely ceased to think of the other world that they have become so ineffective as in this. C.S. Lewis makes this statement and it's a very powerful statement. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. When our mind is on heaven and our focus is there and we're doing everything we can here on earth, God is going to give us souls for our reward while we're sharing the gospel and doing our best to win the loss focused on our eternal home and glory hallelujah if we truly believe that Jesus was telling the truth when he said in my father in John chapter 14 verses 2 through 3 being in my father's house are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you <coughs> I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive unto you 
receive you unto myself that where I am you may be also hallelujah if we truly believe that heaven is a real place then we must be like the servant in our text tonight and do everything in our power going everywhere that we can I keep repeating myself but I'm just trying to drive it home to us here tonight and do everything that we can do to reach everyone we can so that the father's house may be filled so that when the trumpet sounds, they go up with us and they're not left here behind. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Because friend, the place that I'm talking about, and I made it just a moment, it made the statement, if we truly believe that heaven is a real place, I can tell you beyond the shadow of a doubt that heaven is a real place. It is not just a state of mind or a dream, but it's a real place. And it's a place that we've got to make it to and take as many there with us as we can. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My grandpa, he was raised Pentecostal in the hills of Kentucky as a young man and he strayed as he got older. But I can tell you, at 87 years old, knowing his time was short, diagnosed with cancer, he gave his heart to the Lord and he changed his eternal destination. And he called and he was telling everybody, all of his family members and everybody that he could. And he had my dad calling people and telling everybody that they could, that he had gotten saved. And I got to tell you, it was less than a month. <laughs> it was less than a month from the time that he got saved to the time that he passed hallelujah but in those days in those days he did what he could to let everybody know where he was headed that his eternal destination had changed and he was letting everybody know that he could where he was headed and that he wanted them to meet him there when they got there hallelujah he did, at 87 years old he didn't just sit back and say I know my time is short I know I'm about ready to get out of here but what he said was is I know I got family members Members. I've got children that aren't saved. I've got, I, I've got nieces and nephews that aren't saved. But I've got to let them know I am on my way to heaven. And I want them to go there with me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Brother Beecher Noble. Brother Beecher Noble, Pastor Jade's grandpa, and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law Ben's grandpa. He had two encounters in his life. He had two encounters in his life. One as a young man where he saw where he died and he saw hell. And then one as an older man where he died and he came back and he had seen heaven. Hallelujah. And for the sake of time here tonight, I'm, I'm just going to give you the uh, encounter where he saw heaven. If you want to hear the other part of the story, come see me after service or see Pastor Jade. But he's the only person that I have ever heard of that has accounts where he has seen, had encounters seeing both heaven and hell in his lifetime and coming back to see, coming back to tell everybody about it. But Brother Beecher Noble, after he had seen hell and had that encounter, he had no background, no knowledge of church. But when he got out of the hospital, he, he had he made his way to a church. He had gotten saved. He gave his life to the Lord. He got married. He had children. He raised his family in the house of God and led a godly home and he served as an elder and a board member faithfully for decades at Full Gospel Tabernacle and he found himself sick and in the hospital once again as an older man and an older saint of God and he had this other encounter but one of a much different outlook going from seeing hell but now seeing something totally different but he's in the hospital and he, he passes a blood clot that gets lodged in his lung help me tonight Lord and he collapses on one of the nurses in the hospital they call in his family they rush there to get to him and they get there and the doctors and the nurses they're they're all working on him and all of a sudden he colds he flatlines and he's gone the nurses and the doctors they all jump in and they begin to 
do all of the procedure on a flatline patient and they're, they're able to get a pulse back and they get him back and he comes back to himself. Hallelujah. And they get him stable. They get him situated and they get him in his room. And when he's able to start talking again, and my pastor, when I've met my pastor, I mentioned him a little bit ago, Pastor Tim Noble and my brother-in-law Ben, they were there and Brother Beecher had that mask off and he said, Timmy, hallelujah. Ben, come here. I got to tell you something. He said, I got to tell you what I saw hallelujah glory be unto God help me tonight Lord hallelujah when he coded and he died he had this encounter hallelujah brother Beecher he had told his family and he told others and he, he even told me I remember him telling it to me personally but brother Beecher he said he found himself he's walking along a stream and he looked around and what he could see was the most beautiful what he described as the most beautiful colors that he ever could have imagine hallelujah and he said I saw the most beautiful flower garden that I've ever seen in my life hallelujah and he's walking along this stream and, and Ben told me the story the other day I wanted to go over it and he said that he said Papa said that he, he was going and he sat down along this stream by the flower garden and he said that it, that it was not only the most beautiful flowers that he'd ever seen he said but they were moving and they were swaying <laughs> he said, but they weren't just... He said they weren't just moving aimlessly. He said, but there was a rhythm and a, and, a, and a purpose to their movement. And he said that they were dancing. But not only were these flowers dancing, he said, but they were worshiping. They were dancing and worshiping the most, most high God. Hallelujah. And then Brother Beecher came back and he told Pastor Tim and Ben, he said, get all of the family here. I have to tell them. And what he was saying was, is the place that I have told everybody about for years I saw it I saw it with my own eyes it's not just a dream but it's real and I've got to let my family know it's real and we're on our way there and I gotta make sure that they make it there with me glory be to God hallelujah hallelujah glory be to God hallelujah talking with <coughs> hallelujah hallelujah he said I gotta let everybody know that it's real that beyond the shadow of a doubt it's real and I gotta let everybody know that they got to make it hallelujah talking with Pastor Ron this morning I, I talked with him and asked if I could use this and he said that I gave me permission and, and then all, each of these accounts that I'm gonna give you here tonight I wanna tell you that I got permission from everybody to share them but talking with Pastor Ron this morning, he recounted the, the story of me, of Sister Louise in her final days before she stepped into glory. He told me that she had called and asked for him, and he said when he got there, she said to him, oh, Ronnie, you should have been here. Ronnie, you should have been here. They were so beautiful. What was beautiful, Mama? He said, I, she said, I saw the most beautiful horses, and I could hear brass cymbals tinkling and making noise hallelujah hallelujah she was beginning to see the eternal home in glory that she had worked so hard and so long to get to brother Willie Russell every time anybody came through his house me included in his final days he pulled them in close and he would pour into them and he would maybe maybe even for the last time to make sure that they knew heaven was real and they wanted to meet him there hallelujah Brother Gary Witt in his final moments, I can remember Sister Sarah sharing, he began to see what Paul was shown when he was called up to the third heaven. He said, oh, if you'd have seen what I saw, hallelujah, you wouldn't want to stay here either. God help me tonight, Lord, to get this out tonight. He said, if you'd have seen what I saw, you'd want to go to church here tonight more than anything in this life we've got to make it hallelujah but while we're on our way to making it church while we're on our way there we've got to make sure that all of those around us make it too hallelujah can you give the lord a shout of praise here tonight hallelujah hallelujah stand with me here tonight i'm done <coughs> hallelujah Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Hallelujah. These saints of God, they saw the reality of heaven. They knew where they were going. But in those moments, hallelujah, they didn't say, I see it, I'm out of here. I see it, I'm out of here. But they said, hey, you got to make it too. I want to take you with me. I want you to go too. Hallelujah. It wasn't just a, it wasn't just an us for no more mentality, but it was a, hey, it's real. It's real. I want you to go with me. I want to meet you there. I want you to meet me there. Hallelujah. When, when, when the gates open and we make our way in, and you, when the gates open and you make your way in, hallelujah, I want to be of that great cloud of witnesses that greets you as you come in. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. They saw the reality, but they still said, I got to let everybody know. That has to be our mindset and our focus here tonight, church. Of, I know where I'm going. I'm headed there. But you got to still take everybody you can with you. You still got to let everybody know about it. You still got to say, hey, have you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ? <coughs> you still got to say, listen, I know. I know you're hurt. I know you're broken. I know you're lost. But I found myself in the same situation at one time. Can I tell you about the one who found me, who saved me, put me back together, and delivered me and set me free? Church, I'm just going to tell you, nine times out of ten, they'll listen to you. Especially if they're in a state of brokenness and hopelessness because their mindset is, I've tried everything else. I've tried everything else. Why not listen to this person? And friend, you carry the only thing that will help them. Don't keep it to yourself. We can't keep it to ourselves. No matter where we find ourselves, I've been in some of the most obscure places finding myself witnessing. At work, in gas stations, in factories, in machine shops, barber shops. It doesn't matter where you're at. Just give them the gospel. Just give them hope. Give them life. I remember a young man at work. I was, I was at work one day and he come in. He was working with us and his name's Charlie. He uh, broken home. Young man, senior in high school, working, not going to school. Broken home. Dad lives in Florida. He won't ever come up and see. He'll come up and hang out with all of his buddies and go drinking and party, but he won't come see his own kid, Charlie, or his other siblings. Charlie don't know which way is up. He's 18 years old. Comes into the shop one day. I'd already been talking to him about the Lord and he come in and most anybody that knows me, I clock out at 4.30, 4.31, I'm already in my car and I'm, I got a wife and two babies under two that I got to get to see. I found myself standing in the shop at 5.30 talking with Charlie about the Lord, witnessing to him. And I finally just said, and he's, he's crying, he's, he's crying. He's like, man, I just, I don't know. I said, Charlie, you've tried all of these other things. Why not just try this? Why not just try Jesus? Well, I'm, I, I mean, I'm, I think I'm a good person. I said, Charlie, anybody, anybody can be a good person. I said, but it takes Jesus to redeem that good person and save them. He's still standing there crying. I said, Charlie, is, I said, is this something that you really want to do? Do you really, do you want to get saved? He just put his head down and he raised his head up and he said, yeah, Austin, I do. He said, I do. I grabbed him by the hand. 
I was turning the lights off to lock up and go home. My boss was gone. We're standing there in the dark. I grabbed his hand. I said, Charlie, pray with me. And we prayed and he gave his heart to the Lord. Standing there in the dark, leaning up against a forklift. (laughs) Friend, he was locked up in sin. I don't say this boastful. I don't say this boastful, but I say this as a perspective. He was locked up in sin. I carried the gospel key that needed to unlock that lock that he was chained up in. Friend, who do you encounter day in and day out? That you carry the gospel key to unlock the chains of bondage that they find themselves in. Hallelujah. Are we soul winners, church? In these last days that we find ourselves in, are we going to be soul winners? (coughs) Are we going to do everything we can to win the lost? Or are we going to do everything we can to just coast by to glory? And then stand before God the Father, having to answer, saying, you had the key, why didn't you use it? You had the truth, you had the gospel, why didn't you use it? I know that's a sobering question here tonight, and just like Pastor Ron said this morning, I've preached this to myself all week long. We have the key, church. We have to use it. And if you're here tonight or under the sound of my voice and you're not, and and you find yourself in that state where you're not in covenant with Him, I want you to come tonight. If you're watching by live stream and you're hearing my voice, make an altar right where you're at. Jesus can save you right where you're at. Hallelujah. Just ask Him to forgive you and accept Him as Savior. Hallelujah. And let Him save you. Hallelujah. And church, if you're here tonight, And that is your focus. You say, in these last days that I have on this earth, whether it be by way of the grave or whether it be by the way of the rapture, I'm going to use these days to be a soul winner and win the lost. Hallelujah. These altars are open. I'd like you to come and seek the face of God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're in here tonight and you say, God, burden my heart to be a soul winner. Burden my heart to be a soul winner. Give me Holy Spirit boldness to speak and to be obedient when you say, tell this person about me. Hallelujah. If you're in here tonight and you're a believer, I just would ask that you would come and that you would seek the face of the Lord here tonight. Everybody, we want to say thank you for watching today. We pray that this message blessed you. And if it did, please feel free to subscribe. Stay up to date with what we're doing here, as well as follow us on our other social media platforms. Help us reach more people across this world for Christ. We love you all. We pray that you have a blessed day. And we pray that we see you again soon. God bless.